So let's see in the following example a number of uh, uses of these more advanced techniques. The first example is uh, an industrial case in which on the same KUKA robot that we have seen uh, before we compare the performance in terms of tracking a trajectory defined in the Cartesian space. And in, the, uh, in this video you will see on the left the performance that you obtain with the standard controller and on the right hand side one that you obtain uh, with a model based uh, computed torque method so with a method that uses the information on the dynamic model to generate the actual torque command in order to execute the trajectory which is uh, a sequence of uh, three squares position, uh, in position, uh, keeping the same orientation. So this is a 6R manipulator, so there is no redundancy in this case. Uh, and these three uh, squares uh, are along the three coordinate axes. First the y direction, as you see in the horizontal plane, uh, returning to the same point, then in the vertical front plane, and then finally in the sagittal plane. And you will see the uh, difference between uh, the two behavior in the on the left hand side as I said the uh, conventional controller used at that time so uh, sorry the first no let me start like this so this is one square second square and the third square you can see the difference in vibration that you have in the standard regulator with respect to the model based uh, controller we may uh, look again to this let's see how it works yeah. first square second square and third square and you can see that you can tell the different visually so you can imagine that in terms of accuracy dynamic accuracy there's a huge gap between the two the next example example is using learning and using learning in the uh, modality of uh, human imitation in the first phase so there's a human motion uh, being uh, recorded by a Viking system and then mapped into the motion of this uh, B manual manipulators. This is in fact the Justin uh, manipulator by DLR. Uh, so this uh, motion of the human has been parameterized by motion primitives and then uh, programmed into the uh, motion of the right arm of uh, the Justin manipulator. Uh, however, the result was not what expected, so there's a second phase in which the motion is being refined by so-called kinesthetic teaching. So there will be uh, a person, actually uh, Dr. Don Brulli, who uh, will touch the robot and accommodate the arm while in motion under impedance control, so a particular controller that handles motion and uh, exchanges of forces at the same time, in order to accommodate, to ob obtain a smoother, more uh, uh, human-like behavior. Let's see the video. So this is the motion gener generated from acquisition uh, using a hidden Markov model of the human motion. This is the motion being replicated and adjusted by the exchange of force between the human and the robot. And this is the smooth uh, final motion obtained after the refinement. So you can see that there's a learning phase, acquisition from imitation, and then uh, an interaction, a physical interaction with the, with the human. Uh, this next example have, uh, are a result of a collaboration between the Stan Stanford University and our lab at Sapienza, uh, started 
many years ago, I would say. Uh, in the first video on top, uh, we will see uh, how the robot track motion in the Cartesian space or in the actuator space, uh, driven in the first case by a stereo camera and in the second case by uh, a depth sensor, actually a Kinect. Uh, let's see the video first. So on the side you will see the camera, the, the stereo camera. Uh, the user is moving the yellow ball and the robot is following it. And in the second part, uh, there's a Kinect uh, looking at the human. Human is moving his arm and the robot is replicating the same configuration. With some delay, of course. And of course, if you stop the depth sensor, you don't see anything. Uh, by the way, all this um, information, sensor information, is used to generate motion. But uh, in those experiments, uh, a library that is called uh, Reflexes uh, Motion Library is being used, as you see in the diagram on the right hand side, where uh, you process all kinematic information and available constraints, so the maximum velocity of the joints, the maximum acceleration, the maximum jerk, the current um, position and velocity, and the desired one, and you filter out uh, this continuity in order to generate the new states in terms of position, velocity and desired acceleration. So this is being used in all these experiments. The second part uh, uh, is uh, an experiment which involves collision avoidance between a human and the robot. Uh, we will use here redundancy with respect to the end effector task. Uh, again, uh, a Kinect is overlooking the scene. You can see the depth image in the screen on top left. And the robot is, uh, should hold this position. But in the vicinity of uh, 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 in proximity of the human body, in particular the two hand here and the table below, it will reconfigure itself. Now, for instance, coming on the top, it will change, it will stay away from contact. And if you implement also null space control on the elbow, you will see that the elbow has receded much less than in the previous case, and the motion has been realized by the last joints. Um, you can also avoid obstacle by estimating the intention of motion, so the direction of the estimated velocity while uh, the human is moving his hand. So uh, depending on how you uh, approach, there will be a different type of uh, reaction. Okay. Now this was were just preliminary, um, preliminary experiment made in 2011. The collaboration uh, has continued until uh, 2017 at least, uh, where we developed also other methods, including the SNS uh, saturation in the new space method that I presented before. Uh, now, with this in mind, uh, let me come slowly to a conclusion of this lecture by uh, giving a panoramic view of all the control laws that we will uh, look at. So, uh, in all this method, uh, we will assume that the control command is uh, a joint torque or, as we will see, equivalently uh, a desired current uh, sent to the motors, in case of electrical motors. So, uh, in the following uh, lectures, and that remains until the end, we will uh, address a number of problems and we give solution for each of them. In this table, you can recognize uh, the columns, type of tasks, sorry, the rows type of tasks, and the columns, so where we define the error. So this will help us in classify the various situations. Let's start with the type of task. We will distinguish between free motion and motion in contact. In free motion, the robot is unconstrained, and the task may be typically of two types, regulation 
or trajectory tracking. Uh, regulation means that we don't care how we go from one initial configuration, typically at rest, to one desired equilibrium configuration, still with zero velocity. This is a classical regulation task, for instance, needed in pick and place operation. Trajectory tracking instead requires uh, the following continuously of a trajectory uh, which is specified possibly with a path, geometric path, and the timing law. Uh, when uh, the motion is in contact with the environment, so it's constrained by the presence of the environment, uh, we cannot go everywhere, but in fact we cannot enter the surface uh, of the environment. We cannot detach from the surface because otherwise we would uh, fall back into the case of free motion. So while we are moving on in contact, we can also exchange forces with the environment. So these are basically the basic tasks that we can uh, consider. Actually, uh, the basic elementary tasks, they can be combined in order to realize uh, a more high level behavior of the old robot. But indeed, we, we focus on uh, achieving accurately, as accurate as possible, and globally, in a sense, uh, the execution of this elementary task. Now, the method that we will see will differ depending on the type of task, certainly, but also depending on the space in which we define the error. We have already seen this uh, type of uh, reasoning in Robotics 1 when we dealt with kinematic control and we have seen that you can define uh, a joint based a kinematic control where you command velocities in the easiest case uh, and uh, based on an error between the current position and the desired position of a trajectory defined in the joint space or in the Cartesian space where the same is true so you define a command which is still a joint velocity but the error is being generated in the Cartesian space between the actual pose and the desired pose along the trajectory of the end effect. The same story can be applied here when we move from kinematic to dynamic control. So when the input command is a joint torque and not a velocity. And we will come back on this uh, immediately. So we have a, a joint space definition of the error. For instance, we should go from one configuration Q0 to one configuration Q desired uh, at rest. So a regulation problem in which the specification is given in the joint space and the error is the difference between the Q desired and the current Q, starting from the Q0 at the beginning. So in the joint space, a regulation can be solved using quite simple control. Despite the number of degrees of freedom, the non-linearity, the interaction uh, and uh, inertial coupling that exists between the motion of the individual link in an articulated robot arm, we can solve this with a decentralized controller of the linear type, so a proportional derivative to the error or proportional integral uh, and derivative with respect to the error. Uh, decentralized joint by joint. We will show uh, under which condition those type of controller solve the regulation task in the joint space in a global fashion. Uh, as a matter of fact, the simplest one, the proportional derivative controller, works provided that gravity is not present, or is cancelled, or is compensated at the destination configuration. So we will see a number of variations depending on the presence or not on how to, to handle gravity. And in particular, we'll see also an iterative learning scheme in which we can achieve global regulation, so starting from any initial configuration with any initial velocity, getting to the desired configuration with zero velocity without knowing even the gravity vector term in the in the dynamic model and we do this by form of iterative learning when we move in the joint space uh, so generating the error in the joint space 
to the problem of trajectory tracking, we may use again a number of uh, techniques. Uh, the most successful one, the most powerful one, is one based on feedback linearization, which essentially says that you start with the nonlinear dynamics of your robot, you apply a nonlinear control law such that in the closed loop the system behaves exactly as a linear and decoupled system. Decoupled in the sense that each input channel um, affects one individual output, which in this case is a, a joint coordinate. Uh, we will see various implementation of the feedback linearization idea, including the use of inverse dynamics, so a feedforward term based on the Newton-Euler computation of the inverse dynamics of the robot for a given trajectory, plus a PD controller or other form of passivity-based tracking control. And all this require, in a way or the other, the knowledge of the dynamics. So if the knowledge is uh, approximate, we may resort to robot control, uh, which we will probably skip in this, uh, in, in this course, although um, slides are available on the website, while we will uh, address the case of uh, adaptive control, in which we start with no knowledge at all of the model, although we know the structure of the model, so we know a parameterization, a linear parameterization of the model, and we uh, estimate online the dynamic coefficient in such a way that we can guarantee that the tracking error will go uh, asymptotically to zero. Uh, the same story can be repeated at the Cartesian level. The difference is that the error is being generated with respect to a, a Cartesian target. So for regulation we have a desired position or a desired pose for the end effector and we can uh, realize any of the controller uh, that we design in the joint space, so using the error in the joint space, by using the error in the Cartesian space. We will have to deal with singularities, in fact, the singularity of the Jacobian, of the kinematic uh, Jacobian of the robot. So we will present just one particular case, the PD with gravity compensation, um, and similarly we will present one uh, possibility for uh, the trajectory tracking controller, the one based on feedback linearization. But also the other uh, method can be generalized and they all have the same limitation, namely the handling of singularity of the transformation. Uh, finally, there's a, a third space which is uh, of interest in, in this case, in fact also for kinematic control, but here becomes quite relevant. Namely, the more general definition of a task space. Indeed, the task space may coincide with the Cartesian space if, we are, if our task is defined at the level of the end effect of the robot. But there are other situations in which you require a special space in which you define the task and therefore in which you define the error with respect to the desired task. Uh, we will see uh, a specific problem in fact, we will handle this problem at the kinematic level, not at the dynamic level, but in the textbook we will find the dynamic version of it. And I prefer to use the, the kinematic scheme because uh, the problem is uh, that the bottleneck is mainly in the kinematic transformation, which is the visual survey. In this case, we consider only a regulation task, so we would like to move the robot in such a way that the image that we see from an onboard camera mounted on the end effect or typically of the robot uh, coincide with the desired target image. So all the error will be defined in a space which is the image space of the camera. It's a two-dimensional space in any sense, even if the robot has six degrees of freedom. Uh, the typical way in which we address this task is by defining feature in the image, for instance, corner or lines or uh, areas of object that is, are being uh, in the field of view, and we compare this feature with the, their desired uh, value, position, or area, or whatever, uh, in a target image that we have acquired before. 
So this will be the place where we generate an error and the motion of the robot will be driven by this error until this error goes to zero. So we will need in the kinematic treatment to find a proper Jacobian, a task Jacobian related to the visual server. In fact, this will be called the, uh, the image-based Jacobian. Okay. So this is a, a, an extra situation where we are designing a controller based on the concept of task error, which is the generalization of the previous two cases. And this will be uh, relevant also when we moved, in fact, to the uh, motion in contact. In the motion in contact, we don't really are interested in joint space controller, in an error generated in the joint space. Why is that? Because uh, we, the main focus is to handle also the forks of change, which occurs naturally uh, in the Cartesian space. If standard, in the standard fashion, the robot uh, enters in contact with the environment at the end effector level where the robot is carrying the tool. But in general, this contact may occur also in different position along the structure, but still in the Cartesian space. So there is no particular controller of interest when an error uh, is being defined at the joint space, although we could have one, a joint admitted controller, for instance. But in the Cartesian space, um, we have uh, the idea of uh, impedance control with many variants, for instance, the compliance control, and one kinematic scheme, so where the commands will be velocities, in fact, of the joints and not torque, which is admittance control. In both cases, we handle the forces, but we are not regulating the contact force. In the impedance control, we will design a command, a torque command at the joint level, in such a way that the robot in contact with the environment will behave as a mechanical system with a specified inertia, a specified compliance, and a specified damp. Typically, we will use linear decoupled model, and this will be our target model. In fact, it's a kind of uh, it's a problem of model matching. So we design a control such that the closed loop system, consisting of the robot interacting with the environment, behaves as a mass spring damper. Uh, the admittance control, instead, uh, we measure a force, or we estimate a contact force, and we will move the joint velocities according to this force. So, uh, it's a kinematic control scheme. It's a simple situation, which is good when the robot is position control. And I will be uh, more clear uh, in a moment. Uh, in the last controller that we will see uh, from this table, so this table should be kept in your mind when we will go through the various methodologies, is uh, a controller for contact motion, so interacting with the environment, with an error defined in a suitable task space. And this is the hybrid force velocity control, the one that you have seen in the Leuven experiment with Orokos in the previous video. So in this case, uh, the task space is something which typically lives in the Cartesian space, but it's changing orientation and placement. So it's like having a frame which is on top of the surface and has its axis oriented in such a way that along certain direction we cannot move because we would enter the surface or abandon the surface, so moving to free motion. And in those directions, we can only control force. And in other direction, instead, we are tangent to the surface. <coughs> Sorry. And in those directions, under certain assumption, for instance, no friction of the contact, we are only able to control motion. So the velocity along the tangent plane to the surface locally. So in this particular frame where you have decoupled specification on force and specification on motion, typically velocity, you can define also an error. So you, through your sensor, you estimate what is the velocity in the direction 
where you control velocity. What is the force exchange in the direction where you should control forces? You react to force error and velocity error or position errors and you move this information back to the joint level where you command joint torques. So in this case, it's the definition of the error in a specific uh, task space which makes the difference. So we have talked about dynamic or kinematic controllers. Uh, let's summarize this, the situation. So uh, in the uh, recent times, there's a trend in building and uh, realizing, both at the research level but also at the industrial level, so-called torque controlled robots. What would do we mean by that? Essentially, uh, robots that allow the user to specify torques to be generated by the motors. So the control laws issue some current commands. We are assuming that we have electrical motor for simplicity. So commands of currents equal to uh, IC, which where the C stands for the command. Uh, we don't care if this command is coming in a feedback fashion or in a feedforward fashion. Typically, it will contain both terms. Uh, we know that for electrical motors, there's a linear relationship between the current circulating, for instance, in the armature circuit of a DC motor and the producer torque. So by specifying the current, we are in fact specifying commanding a torque. In fact, we can uh, output from a control of a torque and then divide this by the uh, gain Ki for each joint. There's a Ki independent, so to get the right current to be imposed to the model. Uh, and all this information will be based, all, all this um, variable will be generated based on information on the dynamic models and of the task itself. Uh, many times, I would say very often, uh, in this case, there will be a, a current loop on each motor, possibly an analog one, so without problem of sampling and of uh, discretization, uh, which uh, closes a, a current loop at the re level of the motor, so uh, imposes the execution of the desired command uh, in a more reliable way. In alternative to this, uh, and in particular in the case where you have a, a elasticity at the joint because of the particular transmission that you're using, bells or harmonic drives and so on, you may equip the robot with a, a, a torque sensor which measures the transmitted torque through the uh, reduction transmission element. Let's call this torque tau j. Now, uh, when you're commanding a, a current or equivalently torque to be transferred to the uh, link motion, uh, you can use a loop which measures the actual transmitted torque tau j, which in our model of joint elasticity is equal to the product of the elasticity of the joint k times the difference of position between the motor position theta and the link position q, and this for each joint which display elasticity, and compare with the commanded one. And this again enforces the execution of the torque command. All these methods are more complex indeed than the next one that we will see, the kinematic one, uh, they are best suited whenever you would like to achieve a high dynamic performance and in particular when you want to control the interaction forces in a transparent way. I put transparent between quotes because this is a, a term which is often used in haptics where you are rendering on the user a, a remote force being sensed or generated in a virtual world. But transparency in this context would mean that you're able uh, to accurately control the interaction forces that happens to uh, arise at the contact level, typically at the end effector or along the strut. The alternative to this are position control robots uh, or more gen general motion control robots. In this case, 
the control law, like we have seen in, the, in Robotics 1, issues uh, a kinematic command, typically a velocity, so Q dot is supposed to be a Q dot commanded, or an acceleration, or a combination of the two, in any case integrated or micro-interpolated, because uh, you may update this uh, differential command at a lower rate, but internally to the system, you have a micro-interpolation in the intersample, so generating reference position, QC. And this reference, no matter if velocity, acceleration, or position, are uh, inputs, so are reference input, for a low-level direct loop, which imposes these values, and works at a very high frequency. For instance, of the order of 200, 400, 800 microseconds, so below one millisecond of uh, computing or uh, sampling time. So uh, the low-level direct loop may be a simple device, but the fact that it's working at a high frequency makes this method comparable as long as we don't require too high dynamic performance or a transparent control of interaction forces with the torque controllers robots. And to conclude this uh, slide, I should say that there are uh, these two modalities that typically characterize different robots. There are some cases in which the same robotic system may be uh, subject to a torque control law or to a position control law. For instance, the KUKA lightweight uh, LDR4 has both modality embedded in its uh, f um, fast research interface, which is the programming environment for that lightweight robot. So, uh, let me conclude with uh, uh, mentioning um, some kind of taxonomy also for situation in which uh, beyond the traditional task that we have seen before, so um, free motion in uh, regulation task, trajectory tracking task, uh, contact task, uh, defining the joint, whatever defining the joint, Cartesian or task space. Uh, the new case, let's say, of human robot interaction. Uh, this will be also the subject of the last two blocks of slide in the program of the, our course. So the, uh, we start from this typical situation. In industry, robots were where there's no human. So there are cages, there are safety protection systems, such that once you have programmed the robot, possibly with a teach box, uh, the human exits the area of motion, or if it enters, there are sensory systems that block completing the system. So safe defenses are there to prevent the fact that the human operators, operators may be harmed by the motion of the robot. This is a very unlikely event, I would say. Uh, it happened a few times in the past because of uh, not satisfaction of safety rules that should be enforced. Now, this is the standard situation. Now, in, in, for various reasons, exactly because there are still tasks where the robot may be more accurate than the human, but in order to be as flexible and adaptable as the human, it would require too long time, in the best case, if at, a, at all possible, and so it would become non-productive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the operator uh, can do this uh, complex task, typically assembly of uh, uh, multiple parts, in a smart way, recognizing the small uncertainty and the small differences that arises from one case to the other, but are not able to, exert, to exert forces or to hold weights for too long time, so the ergonomic part uh, would be unsatisfactory. This is why, recently, in particular in the Industry 4.0 program, uh, collaborative robots has become uh, a target. So, what does it mean? Uh, here in this picture you can imagine a situation in which you have, in this case, a KUKA lightweight robot. It's not the uh, 
LBR4 is the industrial version, is the AIVA robot, uh, working close next to a human operator. Of course, for doing this, there are a, a number of strict requirements, but essentially, collaborative robots, which are lightweight, as you can see, and equipped with sensors and with control scheme, appropriate control scheme, uh, may allow human workers to collaborate uh, physically uh, with, uh, with the robot, so remaining in the proximity uh, of the robot workspace or inside the robot workspace, exchanging objects and doing uh, a number of things. Indeed, this uh, raises uh, a number of uh, problems. In particular, uh, safety becomes a, main, a major issue. And of course, together with safety, also efficiency. Because if you have to guarantee safety using fences in this condition, then this collaboration would vanish, in a sense. So, in this uh, triangle, uh, again with a hierarchical structure, uh, I listed a number of um, um, uh, safety prescriptions, so um, safety rules, uh, developed by the International Standard Organization, ISO and also for the, the uh, International Electrical Machine Association and, 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 and others. Uh, in particular, uh, the one of most interest for uh, robots, so the main robot uh, safety standards, are contained in these uh, two documents, the 10 to 118 part 1 and part 2. The part 1 is for the single robot, part 2 is for the robotic system as a whole, so with all its surroundings and this um, standard has been done in, has been uh, published in 2011 and since then is guiding all the transformation from non collaborative robots to collaborative robots including that not only this but also the safety for standard non collaborative robots but there's a section that handles also the collaborative case more recently in 2016 uh, this is not yet a standard, it is a technical specification issued by the International Standard Organization, uh, the 15066, uh, um, uh, which focuses more on collaborative and uh, on the presence of the human inside the workspace. So what should be done, what cannot be done, what are the limits in terms of speed, of weight, of power, of forces exchanged, depending on the type of tool being mounted, on the nature of harm that could be done by hitting the human in a different part of its body, and so on and so on. This is a very important issue. Okay, so uh, we will see some scheme that uh, handles human-robot interaction, but before doing that, let me give a, a taxonomy of this type of uh, operation. So, in human-robot interaction uh, essentially has two main uh, areas of interest. The so-called cognitive, so CHRI, and the physical, so PHRI, human-robot interaction. We will deal mostly with the physical one, but let me just say a few words on the cognitive part. So, the situation is the following. Suppose that you have a, a human doing, um, ha having to do some task, a number of action, and you have a robot, that's to be simple, just a single robot, uh, that collaborates uh, for doing the task, the same task. So there are different ways of sharing the actions, uh, they could do uh, independently things uh, in parallel, or they could really interact doing the same operation uh, as a pair. Now, in, in order to do this, there are many models that are being used. And this model pertains humans, robots, or the interaction process itself. So, for instance, um, the models used uh, by people mm, are uh, mental models of how the robot looks like or behaves. Some information coming from the way in which I'm using my social environment and in this social environment there is also the presence of a robot. And of course, 
I should take into account, uh, we should take into account also differences of perception from person to person. All this constitute the models that people have of interact, of, let's say, of uh, different people, including robots. At the same time, uh, the robots use models of the human behavior, uh, of what are the natural motion that are chained in the human behavior. If I'm uh, uh, moving a, a, my left arm, I suppose that I will do something with my left hand and things like that. And these models are joined also with the type of task that needs to be done in collaboration. So the context in which this interaction occurs. And finally, there are models of interaction. Uh, of course, this uh, take inspiration of the uh, human and robot model as well, but in particular are the way in which uh, these two entities, the human and the robot, uh, communicate and coordinate the execution, the common execution of the task. And of course, this coordination may be typically dialogue-based or gesture-based, uh, or based on a formal description of activities, which means that the task requires a certain sequence of elementary action. So uh, if the robot is taking care of some of this action and the human of some other the action, then we follow the development of uh, the execution of the task and expecting that the robot will do its job and the human will do its job. And if not, uh, what should be the communication between them and what should be the coordination which restores the correct operation. And of course, we can use also models which are uh, simulation theoretic in the sense that you have a model of the behavior of the other agent and you collaborate in this sense to get uh, a common task. So this is a very interesting subject but goes beyond uh, the way in which we are presenting advanced robotics uh, topics in this course so but just to have uh, an idea uh, of the difference between cognitive and physical now when we go to the physical part uh, we have developed in fact uh, a three-layer architecture which is our point of view uh, but it's general enough to cover many uh, situations uh, which compares uh, what was planned to do and uh, how we should control the robot behavior in such a way that we realize uh, this consists uh, this hierarchy uh, it's a hierarchy uh, with three layers uh, of behaviors that should be consistent and safe so the lowest level which is always active is safety now on the left side of the of the of the slide you see the fact that there are some mechanical choices that you can do. So you can use a, a lightweight design, you can introduce compliant and robot joints. But essentially, if you have this situation, as something goes wrong, in the sense that the higher level are not able to handle properly things, so this is the lowest direct level present in the, in the, in the robotic controller, which is collision detection and safe reaction. So the robot should be able to detect any unintentional collision and to react to this as fast as possible in the safest way. Uh, one reaction would be just stop the motion. Sometimes this is not the best reaction and other reaction can be devised. And the detection of the collision should be a detection of uh, um, a faulty event, in fact, or uh, in addition, also some isolation, for instance, of the link that has undergone collision. And we would like to achieve this without any extra sensor. So a sensorless collision detection. There are many ways of doing things. We will see the most successful one later on, which was, by the way, developed by our research group. So this is the first layer, always act. Indeed, uh, in many cases of uh, uh, human-robot interaction, you don't need really to exchange 
forces of have physical contact, or the contact is limited just to a um, isolated situation in which you exchange tools or parts with the robots. Okay, but co by coexistence we mean exactly what we have seen in the previous um, picture, namely the robot and the human sharing the same workspace. So while the robot is doing uh, his task and the human is doing his own task in general in parallel with some point of coordination, the main issue here is collision avoidance. So the fact that we can monitor the relative distance between the human and the robot and take action on the robot size because we cannot move the human differently from what he is intended to do. So we change the com command, the control uh, of the robot in such a way that we relax the task that the robot is doing for the purpose of collision avoidance. Indeed, as soon as we have avoided uh, uh, this uh, unexpected collision, uh, we should resume the task for the robot. If something goes wrong, and there are many reasons why this can go wrong, because in this case the coexistence is monitored by sensor, sensor placed in the workspace, so a laser scanner, video cameras, a depth sensor, and so on. So in case something goes wrong, for instance, you have a, a, a lightning uh, of, of your sensor, so uh, at some point you don't detect anything, and there is a collision, then the safety layer uh, is still active, and coherently to that will stop or let the robot react properly. Okay. Uh, during coexistence, you may also change the speed of motion. So some motion that the robot will do at fast speed, when the human is too close, can still do the task, but at a reduced speed. And this will comply with the prescription of the safety standard of the ISO organization. Now, what is the next and final level? It's the true collaboration. In fact, when you hear talking about collaboration in the industrial setting, most of the time people intend coexistence. Because collaboration for us, uh, maybe of the two different types, one is the contactless, huh? for instance, gesture and voice commands, and this goes toward the part, uh, the, the part of activity which is more cognitive human robot interaction. But instead, there are situations in which the contact is intentional and we should coordinate and control the exchange of forces between the human and the robot. And this is a very delicate aspect, as you can imagine, because you're really in contact with the robot. Now, there's also an, an additional problem here in the sense that some contact may be unexpected and, let's say, violent, so they are classified as collision. Some other contacts instead are soft and intentional and they should be treated differently. In case of a collision, the robot should react in a safe way and abandon the area or stop. While in the intentional contact, the robot puts itself into a collaboration mode and now this contact should be, for instance, preserved and the exchange of forces should be regulated. So it's a completely different behavior that we should implement. Nonetheless, even during collaboration, uh, coexistence and safety are still active in the sense that other parts of the robot should not enter in contact with the human, and in case it happens, the safety layer should take the lead and stop the uh, collaboration or do something uh, to bring the system in a safe state. So. Uh, we will see method for addressing coexistence and collaboration. Um, here, uh, I just want to mention, as I said, that in fact, these three layers that we intend match quite uh, nicely with the possible level of physical human interaction that are represented into the ISO safety standard. <coughs> for instance, here, you see on the left, uh, level one and level three, the safety rated monitor stop is exactly when the human is getting too close to the workspace or to the robot, inside the workspace of the robot, and the robot will stop. Or 
speed and separation monitoring is exactly slowing down the motion depending on the area in which the human uh, places itself uh, in the vicinity of the robot. So the green area, uh, the robot continues to do the same task at the same speed. The yellow area, it reduces speed and then probably in the red area, it just stops. While on the right hand, you see more collaborative uh, aspect. In fact, the level two, the hard guiding, is something that exists since quite a long time. So the possibility of putting the robot in a gravity compensated mode, so the robot stays where it is, and the user moves, um, takes the end effector of the robot and guides its motion, like it would guide uh, uh, some, uh, uh, whatever. So guides the end effector through a desired path and the robot will follow while recording things. So this is a kind of a rather conventional programming way. No? Instead of using the joystick and the teach box, you physically move around the robot. And of course the robot is quite heavy, so at least the uh, gravity should be perfectly compensated. And the level four, in fact, is the most interesting one is where you exchange forces and the ISO standard prescribes some limitation of the force that you can exchange and the total power through which the robot is being supplied. So this power will be a composition of uh, speed and, uh, and torque being produced uh, by the motors and this should be limited, for instance, to a value which it used to be 80 watt eh, as a maximum limitation. But uh, this is subject to changes because uh, uh, in the latest technical specification, um, the consideration of which part of the human body is in contact plays also a role, which type of tools is being used plays also a role, and so on and so on. So on the uh, right-hand side, we will see now a video in which a typical collaboration, a very simple one, but also quite uh, effective, occurs. The robot is a KUKA lightweight robot, like the one that we have in, in the lab. Uh, it uses uh, a force device, force device mounted on the defector of the robotics, and beyond the force torque sensor, uh, there is a, a gripper that holds the part. So you see here the human in doing manual position, but let's see the video as a whole. It's a one minute video, so it's quite short. The robot comes, it has a gripper, grabs an object, and the human, as soon as uh, it takes control, now the robot goes into a passive mode, following what the human is commanded uh, in position, and then holding in the stiffest possible way uh, the tool while the robot is doing some, some tasks. So this is a really true collaboration, although the exchanges of forces now does not imply any motion because the robot is being fixed. Now the robot changes posture so that it uh, displays the object in the right way for the operator in order to complete the assembly and so on and so on. You can imagine that things like that can be implemented. Now, going back to our table of control laws, um, let's reprise it for the case of human-robot interaction. So what are the elementary, let's say, bricks of, of control laws that are important for human-robot interaction? Well, I would say, uh, more or less, that Certainly we work in, the, in a certain task space. And the task may, may be the end effector space or a frame which is defined at the contact point where uh, the contact occurs between the robot structure and the human. And we are interested in free motion, both regulation and trajectory tracking, when we coexist because we don't want to uh, have collision, but also in contact motion uh, and in contact motion, we may implement an impedance scheme, an admittance control, or even a hybrid force velocity control. And this could be in the 
Cartesian space or more in general in the task space. I have left the joint space uh, sign because there are cases in which we can do some uh, operation in the joint space, especially if we have redundancy. Because we can have redundancy also in human-robot interaction and we can use redundancy at best. Uh, for instance, for avoiding collision or reacting to collision while preserving the execution of a nominal task at the end of factory error. So with this, we conclude this part. We will start the next lecture with a regulation problem defining the joint space and we will list uh, a sequence of uh, um, simple controller from the simplest one to uh, the PD control to the case of uh, gravity cancellation and compensation. Thank you for listening.